What's up party people? This will be Nixos number 86, where I'm going to be going over Elko Dolstra's PhD thesis, which forms the basis for Nix and Nixos. And I'm just going to take this pretty slow and give you my impression of the introduction to the thesis in this first episode. And then in further episodes, I will do more deep dives into various bits of the thesis. This thesis, written by Elko Dolstra, was uh, the, the thesis that got him his doctorate. Uh, it, was, it was written in 2006, January 2006, Utrecht University, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff in here because the point of this is so that you don't have to actually read the thesis. We're just going to go, we're just going to do the cliff notes. If you feel like reading the rest of it, you can and maybe have a little bit more context, but you don't have to, and you can just listen to me talk. I should mention that uh, although this is a PhD thesis, it's actually quite readable. So this is the introduction. Uh, Elko leads it off by saying, this thesis is about getting computer programs from one machine to another and having them still work that when they get there, this is a problem with software deployment. So he's scoping the thesis out as a, a thesis about deploying software. He is trying to solve a problem, which is that there are a large number of often ad hoc tools that typically automate manual practices uh, of software deployment, but they don't address fundamental issues in, in sort of a systematic and disciplined way. He's bemoaning the fact that a developer has created a bit of software and all he wants to do is get it to some users and it's difficult. And one of the things that makes it difficult is environment issues. In particular, he says, he, he, he talks a lot about software components here. He doesn't actually define what a component is, as far as I could tell, but we're gonna assume that a component is something that ends up in the Nix store, you know, slash Nix slash store. And it could be a, a single file, uh, it could be a static file, it could be a JavaScript file, might be a binary, could be a set of binaries, could be an entire programming language. That, that, that when, when you see the word component, I think that's what you, you should think about. What he says is a software component is almost never self-contained. Uh, rather, it depends on other components to do some work on its behalf, and these are its dependencies. I, I think anyone who's done any software development knows about dependencies. The thesis bemoans that it's it's often difficult to test whether the dependency specification, you know, when, when you when you write software and you want to deploy it, you have to write something down about what you want your dependencies to be. Uh, it's often difficult to test whether those specifications are complete. You know, we might forget to specify a dependency or we, we have a dependency on the machine that we're using to build and to, you know, ship the software to somebody, but somebody else may not have that piece of software, so it won't build for them. A very common problem. He's saying that dependencies aren't just a runtime issue. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of time has been spent trying to line up software such that users end up with a runtime environment with all the right dependencies in them. But really there are problems, uh, getting your, your, your environment set up to build the software in the first place, not a non-problem. It, 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 it is within the scope of his thesis to do this. It's not, he's saying it's not an end user issue. He's saying that the dependencies that are named within some specification need to be compatible with the version of the software they're trying to deploy. Not all versions will work, obviously. So, you know, some range of them may, others won't. Often this is expressed through an application and application binary interface, ABI. And he's saying if all dependencies are present, our component still has to know where they are. It has to go and find them in order to do anything with it. It has to go find it. So like he's saying in Java class path, you know, Python, Python path, and see, there's, you know, the LD library path and et cetera, et cetera. Components can depend on non-software artifacts, you know, like docs and icons and stuff like that. Components can require certain hardware characteristics, like a specific processor type or video card. So he's saying that, you know, you may want to vary your software, the way your software is built based on what kind of architecture it's built for. Finally, uh, deployment can be a distributed problem. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure whether he's talking about deploying on... Uh, like a build farm or something here, or he might be saying that uh, the the components that are used to build some application may need to live on separate machines. And I guess we'll 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 find out what he says more about that. So he's saying we have two problems: we have to identify what our components' requirements are, and then we have to realize those requirements and make them available somehow. It might consist of installing them, creating them, you know modifying configuration files. Um, so that's the environment stuff that software deployment needs to deal with 
that is in scope for Nix. The second category of things that he wants to talk about are manageability issues. And th this really is tooling. This is about packaging these things up. What format are they in? Transferring them over to the network, you know, actually getting them installed, actually putting files on the file system, upgrading stuff that's already on the file system, uninstalling things. You know, I, if, a, if a system administrator asks for all the things that, all the components on the system that are named hello, he, he should get some sort of answer. But also, and this, this, is, this is where we sort of get into the meat of what, what's, what, what may, may make Nix different than lots of things. He's saying, when we perform a component upgrade, we should be careful not to overwrite any part of the component that might induce a failure in another part of the system. He's saying this is the well-known DLL hell. So what he's saying is, if we're going to upgrade some application, we should be careful not to blow away some .so file or, or anything, really. Icon file, you know, anything that some other application may depend on in a way that's going to break it. Querying capability I talked about, keeping software up to date, so running some 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 update regime. But he also mentions here, which a lot of other, other systems aren't concerned with, he says system administrators might, might want to push updates like security fixes to sort of globally install software or software that everybody has. But if users are allowed to administer their own machines, it should be possible for them to, you know, up, upgrade things individually. If if for some reason the system administrator is holding back on some upgrade uh, that the user needs, the user, you know, given some policy, may choose to upgrade it anyway. Another thing, when we upgrade components, it's important to be able to undo or roll back the effects of the upgrade. This is this is purely a next thing. So if the upgrade turns out to break things, you should be able to undo it easily. You need to know what software's in use, whether updates are available, and whether updates should be performed. You know, this is more sort of querying stuff. And then he talks about components being deployed in both source and binary form. This is something that Nix does quite well uh, that other systems don't really have an answer for. Nix sort of treats software deployment as a source deployment issue. Then it puts caches at a point in the, in the, in the deployment scenario because, because of the way that, that Nix builds things and because of this, this cryptographic hashing that it uses for the, for the Nix store, it is willing to download already compiled binaries and you will be able to trust the compiled binaries just as if they had been compiled on your own machine. They will have the same guarantees about their dependencies being correct. And then sometimes you need to vary things and you want to have some, some package except with some, some bit flipped in it and you should be able to do that. The thing he points out in this section, 1.2, the state of the art, is that uh, the, ma the major thing he's fighting against, remember this is 2006, uh, pretty much pre-container stories. Um, although, of course, there's, there were all, all sorts of ways to, to do this then. It's just they weren't quite as popular. But he's saying traditionally Unix systems have traditionally insisted on storing components in a global namespace in the file system, such as the user bin directory. He's saying that that's not, maybe maybe that's an anti-pattern. This, this is the reason that Nix doesn't adhere to the Linux file system hierarchy standard. This, this bit of the realization that is presented in this thesis. Linux package management talks a bunch about RPM and how RPM is used to, you know, I'll just, I'll just use a short term, sh shorthand of like sort of hash, half measure ensuring that both the person that builds uh, the binary and the person who uses the binary will be able to use the result. What he points out is that when someone, when the end user actually uses RPM, two packages that contain files with equal path names can't both be installed at the same time, or at least if they are, things get really weird. So you can't, what, what that effectively means is you can't have multiple versions of the same component. This also means that it's hard for multiple users to independently select and install and manage their own software. Systems that don't allow you to do this will invariably be bound to some global user uh, needing to install binary dependencies on the system. And only that user can do that. He's saying that missing dependencies lead to incomplete deployment. So if you deploy some piece of software and it doesn't name the right set of dependencies, uh, let's say it needs a Zlib and it doesn't name Zlib, then your software, software will break at runtime. The specifications that uh, he mentions uh, that are part of Nix should prevent that from happening. He says dependencies tend to be inexact. Uh, they're done, done typically by name, not by contract. So any component with a certain name 
will satisfy the specification requirement for a dependency, but might, might not actually work. Another subtle problem in RPM and most other deployment tools is that it has the property of destructive upgrading. Components are upgraded by overwriting existing files with new ones. And what this means is that at some point in time, while this is happening, the system is an unknown state. It's temporarily inconsistent. Uh, it also means that upgrading isn't atomic. Uh, easy to get into a place where you have a package that is installed halfway and you have to take manual steps to back it out. The within scope index is something that uh, makes this not happen anymore. And he talks about some sort of dependency hell things. This is more a 2006 thing than a uh, current day thing. Uh, nobody uses RPM by itself these days. Then he sort of, you know, uh, starts to talk about a different kind of model that's not RPM, uh, that's more oriented towards source builds. And he talks about the free FreeBSD ports collection. These are essentially make files that describe how to build some piece of software. And of course he mentions that, you know, the problem with such things are to build this stuff, you, you know, it requires lots of resources. You, you know, he says that there are some, some ameliorations for this in FreeBSD, but they're sort of, the stuff doesn't quite line up such that that the, that the result of installing a, a binary package is for sure known to be the equivalent of installing uh, the same package via source. And then he talks about Windows and Mac OS and how these systems tend to use monolithic deployments so that everything required by some application ships with, a, with everything else that that application requires. There are no shared dependencies. This is this is where we start to get into the motivations of why he's writing his thesis. So he says, dependency val specification is not validated leading to incomplete deployment. So he's talking about, you may not wind up with exactly on one system what you, what you wind up with on another system. It's not possible to deploy multiple versions of things because they, they need to live in a global namespace. This means they can interfere with each other. It's not possible to roll back to previous configurations. And because of this, destructive upgrade stuff, uh, upgrade actions aren't atomic. He's saying applications must be monolithic. I think what he's talking about here is that he's bemoaning the fact that currently, you know, Windows and Mac applications are monolithic. Deployment actions can only be performed by administrators, meaning that normal users usually aren't part of that equation. There's no link between binaries and source in the build process that built them. The binary asset is not a product of the source build. The way that the binaries are built that that get jammed into into some binary only distribution may not be the way that the source build builds them. Difficult to adapt components. I think what he means here is that the specification used to talk about how to build a piece of software isn't the code that's in there isn't usable outside of the context of building that particular component. Component composition is manual. I don't really exactly know what that means. Component framework is narrowly restricted to components written in a specific, specific programming language or framework. Uh, I think what he means here is like .NET will allow you to do a lot of resource, like uh, component sharing, but God help you if you want to use some Java Java piece from, from .NET. Non-portable techniques, don't know what that means. He's saying that these things are what the thesis is going to go after. He's saying that he has done these things <laughs> and now these are the contributions of the thesis towards solving those problems. So he's saying he's now got a cryptographic hashing scheme used by the Nix component store, the Nix slash Nix slash store, and it prevents undeclared dependencies, saying there are isolation between components. So if you uninstall something uh, that is required by one piece of software, it won't necessarily, it won't break Another piece of software that requires the same thing it says that users as opposed to administrators can install software independently from each other without trusting anybody. Upgrades are atomic. Uh, you can roll back. There's automatic garbage collection. Nick component language describes not just how to build individual components, but also compositions. I think what he, I think what he means here is that you can compose something like a service, transparent source binary deployment model. He's saying that the product of the source build is the binary. The existence of the binary means that you know that it has been built in the same way that if you had built it on your machine, it would be built. It just sort of skips the build process. Uh, policy free provides mechanisms, does not enforce a specific one. So he's talking about sort of the division of responsibilities here. Um, you know, there, there, there is, there is a, a Nix command, but 
there's a whole other set of primitives that like the store that are independent of the next store of, of the of the next command system they're not they're not sort of jammed together uh, supports an efficient component upgrade, despite the fact that a change of fundamental component can propagate massively through dependency graph. Ah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> we just had that happen with XZ. It took 10 days. Some of this stuff is more successful than others. And, oh, now he's talking about service deployment as opposed to component, uh, you know, application deployment. So I'm not sure whether I got it right or not about compositions up here. We might not be talking about services there. The thesis itself is divided into four parts. Part one, which we're in right now, is sort of an overview of what he thinks he's achieved. Uh, part two is about the principles and the formal semantics of Nick, so it describes the language, um, describes sort of the theory of operation, uh, garbage collection, uh, probably the transparent binary source model, whatever, just sort of all the bits and pieces as, as they stand as as individual, individually evaluable things, but not as a system. And then in part three, he talks about uh, the various applications of Nix. And the way I think about this is the tooling that, that sort of makes it all work together. So probably like, you know, the Nix command and Nix OS rebuild and Nix OS itself, like the, the concept of Nix OS. I think this, PhD thesis may have may have predated or at least a mature version of NixOS. And I think that's about it. Uh, I think that's what I'm going to talk about today. In the next one, I will continue on through this overview Nix chapter. Let Elko give us some intuitions about underlying principles.